Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon at SG Innovate. Uh, we're very pleased to have such a great showing today at today's event. Um, so at SG Innovate, we believe that Singapore has the resources and capabilities to do great things from Singapore for the world. And that's why we organize a lot of such knowledge sharing sessions to, to share with everyone what's happening within the deep tech scene, um, not just in Singapore, but also um, around the world. Um, and today we're very happy to be partnering with NUS SSI on a topic on the future of finance, something that I think is very important and uh, very exciting. And that's why we have so, so many of such good people around here today. And so um, without further ado, I'll first introduce Kelvin from NUS uh, SSI to actually give us a little bit quick introduction about themselves. Thank you. Thank you very much, Shin. Uh, thanks, everyone. I'm Kelvin from uh, Smart System Institute. This is the, my director. He's the boss of uh, Smart System Institute. I'm in charge of uh, the uh, business development. So my role is to, uh, to uh, find opportunities to uh, help technologies get translated to the market. And this is why we uh, are very happy that this is the first of uh, four series this year uh, to partner with SG Innovate. And we'll thank them for giving us the opportunity uh, to reach out to a different community. Uh, traditionally, we do posters, shows, and events uh, within NES as well as at Block 21. But this is the first time that uh, we have you know, experts like uh, Plof Hui uh, and uh, some of our other colleagues who are on hand here uh, to, to explain a bit more what we do, uh, not in you know, our own tower of uh, secrecy, but really to bring out um, the best knowledge out here and to collaborate. So we hope to uh, see uh, just as good support for the next three um, you know, of these uh, talks uh, each every quarter. Uh, we also have one InnoFest session coming up, so we hope that uh, you will attend and uh, support us at InnoFest on 27 and 28 of June at Marina Bay Sands. So without further ado, I'm going to pass the, the mic over to uh, Prof Wee, and he'll explain a lot more of uh, the exciting work we're doing in Smart System Institute. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Ben Chin. I'm directors as well as uh, distinguished professors of NUS. I've been with NUS for the last 30 years and have been working on database systems. I released the first Apache system from Singapore, Apache Singa. That was uh, even before uh, TensorFlow and CNTK. Of course, we lost out in the end partly because we could not compete on resources. So today I'm going to talk about AI as well as data-driven support for FinTech. Uh, I have 40 slides, so I'm going to rush through very quickly, and hopefully you can catch some. If you need more information, do come back to us. Uh, on top is one of my startup, Centillium, is on FinTech. It will be easier and cheaper to go through my startup than to engage me as consultant. <laughs> I charge 5000 to 8000 a day, whereas you work with a startup, you get codes, everything, and could be much cheaper than my, my, and I still have to put in the effort. So today I will talk about AI. What do you expect out of AI? AI, you have seen it has done amazing things, but on the, on the other hand, you can see that even AV, autonomous vehicles, still cannot run on the road. It can run on the controlled environment and at a slow speed, like warehouses and all those. Again, that's a failure of AI in that sense. It just can't react to randomness. Uh, you have plenty of data. How many of you are from finance, from uh, banks? Okay. Banks uh, quite often have the network isolated. You do not want people to see your data, yet you want to exploit AI unless you have big check account to employ all sorts of AI people, even you have, you might, not to get, you might not be able to get the best. Yet, on the other hand, you want to exploit AI, yet you can't really exploit AI without letting people see your data, because data is the one that drives learning, learning drive analytics. So we need to see the data in order to design models, train the model, and so on. I'll go through our soft, software stack quickly, and I use financial news analytics, which is of interest to the banks, on the risk analytics. When you want to loan more, or you want to react, or you want to buy more stocks, and trading, and so on. 
So these are the slide taken, uh, the example taken from AS, MAS. So when you look at it, first column, basically you do not need AI. That will be an overkill. Uh, you can done without AI. For second column, you can do a bit of machine learning, but still not much. It's the third column onwards that machine learning and AI could become very useful to help you to analyze the data, to predict, and to outperform human. But in actual fact, it's not easy to really deploy AI. It's suppose today you think that AlphaGo is so great. Can you use it on your application? You can't. Even there's a transfer learning, you can't really transfer from one domain to another domain. The worst still is such that if there is a drift on labeled data distributions, on data distributions, your AI models may not work as well. Just take a look at Google virus uh, detections program they have in 2008. By 2012, it starts to fail because it cannot detect the onset of virus. You can, it could in 2008 through the news, through the news that you can say, oh, there's an onset of virus. Uh, but after some time, it just won't work. So that's a problem of machine learning. It's non-trivial. But to really to deploy AI, you need to spend about only 5% of your time on development of AI models and so on. The rest of the time, what we do, we have to clean up the data. It's a mundane job. We have to clean up the data, improve the data quality, do the data extractions, transformation, loading, integrations, and pruning, and so on. Then we design the model. After we design the model, we have to start to tune the parameters. There are plenty of parameters to tune. Today, for some, for example, but from uh, Google, they have about 340 million parameters. So there are so many parameters for you to choose and pick and all those. Therefore, it's very tough to deploy models in that sense if you want to have a good, effective uh, models. So that blurs the line between database and non-database processing. So today, we think that database systems are going to integrate more and more AI algorithms into their systems, not only just to do predictions, to do better analytics, but also to improve their own system performance. On the other hand, the AI people so far have been focused on accuracy and functionality. They do not care as much on efficiency of performance, like what database people do. So for us, we work on data flow, we work on performance uh, efficiency design engine to speed up, while we care less about accuracy. We assume that accuracy remains the same, then I should be able to lower down your latencies and give you a good response time. Now, to most laymen, what you care about is just analytics. You want to analyze the data, but before you can do that, you have to acquire the data, clean, extract, annotate, and integrate. Then after which only you analyze and visualize. So where is the big data? We heard about these uh, terms for many years now. So big data basically consists of all the phases of the whole process from the time we acquire the data to uh, the phase that we visualize the data and AI be applied from data cleaning onwards to visualizations. And how about data science? Today, if you are a data scientist, you can command huge amount of pay. Suppose if you work for Alibaba, the starting pay is about 300 to 400K today for those with a PhD, of course. Uh, that is the current ongoing rate. And to get into NUS, you need all A's. Even all A's, you can't get into emitter into computer science. When I was dean from 2007 to 2013, we used to take in 400. Today, we, had to, we have to take in 1,100, as determined by uh, MOE as well as Ministry of Manpower to train enough people for the market. 
So there's a data science, the last two phases, you want to analyze and interpret re the results in the context of applications. For example, I know a little about FinTech, I know a little, very little about banks operations, but I pick up the domain knowledge, then from there I interpret. The same for healthcare, I have to spend many years just to understand the healthcare terms, to pick up the knowledge in order to interpret what are the different diseases, ICD-9, ICD-10, all the millions of terms that they have out there. So AI in a nutshell is that you have input and output, you want your output predictions to be as close to the ground truth, as close to what you expect to predict. So that basically is the input-output uh, computations. We try to train the data and then clean the data, train it, and do the predictions. Hopefully that predictions is as accurate as what we expect to see, like human. So there's a whole process of AI, but we forget there's a part that there's a drift. After a while, there's a drift on data distribution, as I said, on labor distributions, then your AI models or your neural network models no longer work as well. So you either retrain or have to redesign a new model. Quite often, people will just retrain, but even retraining might not work after a while. So there's a workflow, and we get the original data, cleanse the data, one off. For example, we clean up NUH data. For 13 years data, we took two years just to clean that 13 years data. And even after using the machines to clean, we could only manage 90%, 10% still rely on humans. So this is a crowdsourcing to the young doctors to clean up those data. They are too dirty, partly because of change of terms, use of terms, uh, change of uh, terminology and so on the codes that used to codify diseases. They have been changed from ICD-9 to 10 and so on. And of course, long ago, before some of you were born, there were no type complete. So we have to remember by heart, put in what we can remember for that definitions or for that description. That create lots of noise on the data. So we have to clean the data. Once you clean the data, for some mod model, for example, supervi supervised learning, we have to label the data. We can do unsupervised learning, but that's basically just a bit of clustering, a bit of classifications. It won't be as effective as supervised learning. So once we have that, we have AI model, we train it, we get uh, predictions, we keep the history, and there's a drift we want to be able to detect. Now, today, when you talk about AI, people talk about auto ML. Automate the machine learning. It wants to learn the data prior, wants to be able to design the model itself. It's just like programs, rights program. Today, we want to have a model that design a model based on your input, based on your expected output, the number of layers that you have, the resources that you have. I search and give you a recommendations on the model. That is happening. That is known as a network architectural search. It's expensive, but we are moving towards that direction. <coughs> now, to scale, definitely we can't just do the data clean on our own, so there will be uh, collaborative data cleansing, collaborative data analytics, but how to support for example, deep learning under privacy preserving concerns because GDPR and so on, it can, uh, you remember the le uh, recent leak of the HIV data, uh, the theft of other data. So all these create fear in, in most organizations. They tend to have isolated network and therefore it's so much harder to get the data to design the model today. And how to uh, perform timely quality control for online predictions? How do we know when the model no, no longer works? Suppose you have models to do your stocks predictions, and it doesn't work. You won't be able to tell until you start to lose lots of money. It's just like if you are traders, quite often the model doesn't work, and the traders are let go, and then they have to start to think of new models in order to outbid 
others and outbid the market. And how to manage data for multi-users applications. These are basically the factors, considerations that we have to consider from system angles to scale AI. Not just for one person, <laughs> have only five minutes. Uh, so, uh, so these are Fox Cloud for Git for Data, the one that we uh, have done is that because of GDPR, PDPA, the data can't be shared, and yet most people wants to uh, design AI algorithm, wants to engage external experts to design algorithms. And without seeing the data, we just can't design the algorithms effectively. We go back to the no free lunch theorems uh, proposed in 1997, says that there's no useful model algorithm for all the data distributions. Therefore, that's why I said when there's a drift, the model may not work as well. Now, this is uh, something that you're familiar with. If you are from the banks, you have want to improve your customer experience, you want to optimize operation. Those can be done using your internal data, but for risk analytics, you have to get the data from outside, from the news, from uh, all over the places in order to uh, work together with your data to do the predictions. For the banks, as I said, the main problem is that it's an isolated network. You have your own internal network that you will not let any programs come to interact with your system directly. So you put a firewall, a very strong firewall, even if something coming out from outside, there could be a small conflict for exchange of data, that's all. So you can't write on the external information, you can't uh, engage third party uh, analytic experts effectively. And so we propose a solution such that we build a sandbox-like architectures to protect the organization from disclosing the data, yet allow third party to design their models on the data. So what we have is a bit like GitHub, but it's much more than GitHub because we support data cleansing, curation, integrations, and of course like GitHub, we provide immutability. We use Mercury to make sure that once the data is stored, nothing can be changed. This is important for banking industry. You don't want to change the data. Even you change it, you want to know who changed it so that where you need strong data provenance. You want to know how the data evolved from that sum to the current sum and how the data, how the value has been moved out and so on. So this is a system that we designed. Fogbase is the engine, uh, 40,000 lines of C++ code, and then the outer layers is basically the sandbox. So we have our own uh, machine learning, deep learning platform riding on Apache Singa, machine learning as a service, machine learning is trying to make it as easy for uh, non, uh, non, uh, non uh, technical people to use, we want to turn all the subject matter experts into data scientists. Just like today, many of you know our programming, know a bit of SQL, so that our intention is to convert everyone to make it easy for other people to explore the data. At the end of the day, for someone like me, I do not know what are important, what features will affect the outcome. In fact, the subject matters are the one, just like doctors know what features will lead to renal failure, will lead to kidney failure and so on, only the doctors know. I, to me, every number is just a value. So that's the stack that we have. We have uh, crowdsourcing Kohana, and the front this bit is our Apache Singa. It's open source. We release uh, Rafiki, which is uh, Apache Singa 2.0. It's a machine learning as service. It provides hyperparameter tuning. And of course, you need help to exploit Apache Singa. We are more than happy to provide help free of charge because it's uh, from Singapore. So this is an example that we built and deployed at NUH. So we built the sandbox on our own systems, using our own systems so you can the fault base, manage the data and different uh, analytics modules have been developed. For example, re-emissions modeling, uh, disease progression modeling, those are being used to help the doctors at NUH. They have to go through testing, lab 
trial and so on before they can be accepted to say that this will facilitate, will help the doctors to do their job better. Now I'll go through quickly, and this is what concerns most, uh, is the news. News affect the stocks. News affect what will happen next, will affect the index, and suppose you are traders, you will care about what news are out there. So some news uh, show the sign of risk. For example, sanctions, you will affect the companies, will affect not just the country, but companies, and then downgrade as well. You just need some people to write bad about certain companies. There's a downgrade. Many people will just dump the stocks and so on. That will affect the stock movement. And opportunity, for example, of course, Huawei is a bad example. Now, suppose Apple's. Apple starts to buy, uh, to, to introduce new models, and you expect the new model to sell well. If it does sell well, means that supplier that supply the parts to them will follow to do well, because most parts to be supplied to them. And acquisition as well, that will affect the movement of stocks, the index. And of course, there are plenty of news you can buy, but quite often, many of them are useless and you won't have the time to go through every piece of news. They are just too many, and many articles about saying the same thing as well. So you have to step through all the news. Basically, you are paid for just uh, going through the news without having to do anything. It's, it's not a bad job. You get good pay, and yet just read news. Uh, but some companies, uh, the news is biased. Some companies tend to attract more news. Small companies tend to attract less news, but that doesn't mean that they are less important. So you just are your small cap and big cap companies and how they perform, that depends on market uh, uh, value ratios and all those. So that effect uh, will have the effect on how you're going to trade on the stocks. And of course, to do that, we have to deduplicate the news. It's time consuming and we have to build the knowledge graph then from there, we have to use that knowledge graph, use the deep learning models, try to, uh, try to indicate that the news is a risk, indicate a risk or an opportunity. And of course, we can do more, try to predict stock price and index movement and so on. Uh, I will go through this, I won't go through this because of a uh, time constraint. So there are plenty of uh, work that have been done trying to remove the news duplicates and try to identify good news. In order to do, to do that, we need to identify the relationships between two entities. For example, uh, two person, uh, person and organizations and then the relationships that I extract from the sentence and of course, I have to get rid, get rid of the noise as well. And very often we make use today, we make use of deep learning model, so we try to tokenize uh, the sentences, then do the word embedding, put in the markers, try to detect the relationship between those words. So basically it's encoder and decoder. We try to encode into a pattern form, given something, then we try to decode. So that is basically the basic concept of most of these translations, most of this mapping from one layer to another layer. So this again, the step involved, uh, we have to remove the noisy text, infer the relations of the entities in new sentences. And of course, just now uh, I got someone talking about sentiment analysis. Sentiment analysis is just uh, not strong enough today to use on stocks because once uh, when a product is introduced, you tend to have positive, negative uh, uh, review and so on. So we need a different approach. We need a different approach to classify the text, the document, that whether it presents market opportunities or a risk that we have to consider. And today, as I said, you can use different deep learning models for classifications. CNN, RN are two well-known methods, the BERT, bidirectional encoder, representations from transformer is the new model introduced last year by Google. It shows very good results, but that's basically for language translations. It's huge. It has 1,000 plus layers. It means that you need lots of resources just to run 
that model, train that model. It has 340 million parameters. So you can see that the models is getting deeper, the model is getting wider and more complex. You need lots of resources just to run, even though we have a much faster machines today. So these are some of the recent work. The first work is from uh, my colleagues and the student from NUS. Uh, that's basically how to inject relationships, knowledge graph onto the predictions, onto the deep learning model, try to predict better. And of course, this is another example that uh, the bankers, traders might be interested about. Uh, Again, uh, submit and if you might have different uh, models trying to outdo the market, trying to sell with a better revenue or profit. Of course, you can think of reinforcement learning, just like reinforcement learning has been used on AlphaGo, but can you possibly try out with all the possibility, find the best path to get to your best target? You can't, because in high stack applications, you try to do that, you're going to lose lots of money before you learn anything, but once it's a change, you start learning again. So for some of this, it can be applicable to games, but not to real life ongoing thing. Just like this reinforcement link can be used for healthcare applications as well. So in summary, AI has provided great improvements uh, in predictions on the var varieties of applications, including high stack uh, applications. As I said, unlike games, machines cannot learn by playing out all the possibilities. It's just not possible. Uh, AutoML, network architecture search, and certainly what we have done is on model ver verification. Suppose someone proposed a model. Can I say this model is going to work? It's going to give you a certain amount of accuracy depending on your input and your expected output. Since I can do NAS, I can design a model for you, that means I should be able to verify if a model is effective for your application or not. All these have reduced the barrier for adoptions, but a lot more needs to be done. So definitely, we are getting there slowly. It's getting better. Data is a new oil, but we need quality oil. We need to improve the data and it is its value, but sensitive data is problematic at this moment because the GDPR, because of uh, data sharing problems today, it's very hard to get hold of real data, it's very hard to get hold of real data, and therefore, it's even much harder to train the models. Okay, I'm done, and uh, I can take a few questions. That I agree. If uh, AI is that good, I won't be standing here. I will, I will do my own algorithm and make my money. <laughs> the problem is that it takes time to learn, takes time to improve. And as I said, you can say I have all sorts of AI solutions for you, but without knowing exactly what you need, how you're going to use it, there's no way that we can deliver good AI solutions. I agree that it's about functionality. Uh, efficiency is just another problem that we have to address because most people say if it takes one day to run, 
it's okay so long as it's not too long. But for some of these real-time response, for example, stop predictions and all those, you need really fast engine, just like high-frequency trading. It's about speed. So. That, that I say, I, I, I have no problem. I agree on that. The problem is that most people will not, most banks will not disclose what they have. Once you disclose what you have, you lost that advantage. Universities in Singapore like NUS and NTU are ranked very highly for AI research. In fact, we are the top in Asia. Of course, the government has also spent a lot of money uh, for research in, a, uh, in ASTAR. How much of it has translated, you know, for example, into really real-life application in smart nation, etc., etc.? Or a lot of this sort of things are actually still in the lab without real-world uh, relevancy? Thank you. Uh, that's why we try to reach out. Just like today, we are here. It's a community service, try to reach out, and it's up to the community to exploit what we have in NUS. We have, we try to bridge, try to do as much as possible, try to translate as much as possible, try to bring uh, the algorithm designed by the professors, the researchers, as close to what industry may need as possible. But that's the best we can do. We cannot say I design solutions, spend all the money, and waiting for people to come adopt. So it's about you need two hands to clap. So we, we seek your understanding. And of course, we are more than happy to work with the industry. Today, we are here, uh, get bullied to some extent by SGI to say I have to be we have to be here. <laughs> Uh, guys, so after this, we will have a panel discussion that follows, and there will be more time for questions and answers as well. So right now, let's take another, yep, let's take one more question by this gentleman uh, before we start. Um, there are some blockchain projects right now that are working on getting data in a form that can be shared and monetized and utilized for, you know, all these purposes like AI, um, does it mean that it can by design be in a better format without so much cleansing and you know, uh, co collating that you're yeah. talking about? Does that help? You are, you are talking to the right person. I happens to be the one released the first, the world first benchmarking system to benchmark Ethereum's parity and all other systems. The problem is that blockchain systems do not scale. With the death of ICO, the coins go down to about 90 by 90, 100 percent. One ICO is dead, coin is dead, exchange will be dead. So who is going to follow up on blockchain? The main problem with blockchain is that it just does not scale. Uh, you can see all the white papers talking about a few hundred transactions per second. But today, you look at Visa. Visa is a good example that we often use to benchmark. Visa hit about 25,000 transactions per second. Suppose you want to do that to the real world applications, you need to hit that number. But quite often, you can't. Why you can't? Because blockchain of the consensus model. So today, people let go of the consensus model, relax it, and go for dispute ledger. Dispute ledger, what does it mean? Basically, I just replicate the ledger. Distribute it, it's just like distributed systems. And how you distribute it, of course, it's faster. I don't have to use PBFT. I can use just a more efficient parcel to coordinate, to synchronize the distribution of data. I know one protocol that can engage maybe a transaction to the second half of the 
I, I don't, sorry, I, I don't mean to, to, to be skeptical, but as a technical guy, we have been doing that with benchmark. Uh, it's not easy. Even I do sharding, I do using SGX, trusted hardware, push some of the codes into the code base on the SGX, I just can't hit that number. I look at uh, the system from Intel and all those, they can't hit that number. They hit at most one to 2,000 transactions per second. Um, so quick one around using algorithms to predict stock prices. So as you, I'm sure you're aware, professionals have been trying to do this for decades, and the academics have also spent a lot of time checking their prediction powers. Um, and what you could arguably say is that over the long term, they're not necessarily very good, some people think they're no better than random, and, and these are the, the highly paid professionals, right? Um, so when you've got your AI algorithms, have you done any research yet to test them over the long term to see how successful they are, if they're better than the professionals, or even if they're better than just pure randomness when it comes to, say, 10 years' worth of stock picking success? Okay, that, that is a good question. So suppose I have to test it, the best way to do instead of just following the market for the next one to two years. I'll take the past time series until whatever point that I know, so I try to emulate the tradings from there onwards. That's what most of us would do. Rather than to say today, uh, because of some healthcare uh, algorithm I'm introduced, AI algorithm I'm going to introduce, therefore I pro follow that application for the next five to 10 years uh, is, is not quite possible because most researchers will not stay for that long and then the, the, the trend changed very fast. Just like today, you look at all the algorithms, the model being introduced, it changed so fast. Uh, for AI publications, there are about 10,000 per year. Even to go through them, to get some important publications just to read will have a tough time to follow what are good, what are important. So we tend to follow the leaders. So like Google Brain and all those, some known group, people tend to follow once they uh, have certain reputations. Uh, I, I wouldn't say it's random. I would say it can be quite accurate. And the problem is that, of course, there is a change of envir environment. Just like you do stock trading, when you let go of the stock, you try to dump the stock, there are other reactions that follow. It's much more complicated than that. And not only us use the algorithms, others are using the algorithm as well. So it depends on who can predict faster, who can react faster, who can optimize better. So in the end, that, that, uh, the, the person who does this better will win. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Prof. Wee. Can I invite um, our two other speakers to join us on the panel? So thanks for being here. You guys have been awesome, really awesome. Uh, do you need like five seconds to stretch? You want to stretch out a bit? No? OK. Um, please have a seat. There's, there's only one toilet, which is on your left and on my right. Um, so uh, we'll, OK, why don't we just go ahead and uh, begin? <laughs> So I'm super excited to uh, be able to moderate our panel today, uh, and uh, really proud of our team uh, who's, been, who's managed to find us some awesome speakers. Uh, as you can tell, this is not a panel. You know, uh, we actually have more women than men on our panel today, which I'm very happy about. Uh, <laughs> um, and the topic today is the future of finance, right? Uh, the future of finance, yes, correct. And and uh, that's very um, broad. We'll try to keep it within the um, expertise of our speakers, you know, and, uh, and of course, you know, we'll have a question and answer session right at the end. So, uh, my name is Victor. I am with SG Innovate. I work on our venture investing team. Uh, been with us, been with the organization for about six years. Just came back from uh, San Francisco, where I, where I was based for about, for the whole six years. Uh, and uh, very excited to meet all of you later. So, I don't want to butcher all your, all your credentials, so I'll uh, let you guys introduce yourselves. So maybe can we start with uh, Kasia? Thank you, Victor. Kasia Mionskevich. I work at 
I work at UBS um, at uh, our Center for Design Thinking and Innovation called Evolve. Before that, I spent uh, almost eight years in strategy consulting in uh, Poland, uh, Europe, India, and Singapore. Hi everyone, I'm Kath. I work for AXA Insurance here in Singapore. I've been with the group for over 14 years, uh, responsible for customer experience and transformation. So over 14 years, I've seen a lot of transformation in insurance, um, so quite excited to be here. and. I'm not really a technologist, so I'm very impressed by what's being discussed here. Um, but I'm really here to talk about it from a customer experience angle and what it means in terms of business impact. Hi, I'm, I'm Benjin, the plumber. Some say the best in Singapore and Batam, and some say also JB. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. So before we start, maybe just to get some demographics from the room, um, how many here are entrepreneurs? Just raise your hands, please. Oh, okay, about five, six. Um, how many are academics? Another six, seven. Um, how many are from corporates? Okay, pretty good. Huh? Um, SMEs? Oh, none. Startups, anyone? Working in a startup, founded a startup? Okay, and how many are in venture capital? None, okay, good. <laughs> um, how many of you here are from the finance industry? Not the fintech industry, but finance itself? Okay, and, w and within that, fin uh, who are you from the fintech industry? Okay, okay. Last question, how many technologists here? Oh. Interesting. Okay, there's only seven of you. Okay, <laughs> and the rest of you are in business, I would presume. Okay. Okay. So let's get on to the first question. Um, my role here is just to facilitate this discussion. I want you guys to just talk as much as you can. You know, I'll I'll butt in when I need to. Um, uh, maybe we, let's start with the current financial industry landscape, right? Like a lot has changed in the past uh, six years. Um, I've seen the growth of the fintech industry or just the startup industry in Singapore, you know, and all this has happened in the past, I would say, five to six years, about 2013, 2014, and a lot has changed. Right, coming back from North America to Singapore, wow, you know, like a lot, a lot has really changed. Uh, I would say a lot of the things that we do here are actually a bit more advanced than what I've seen, you know, in North America. Um, so maybe from your perspective, from all three of you, um, and in your line of work, so how has the rise and, and, and kind of like the proliferation of fintech change the financial sector in, in your space and, and in Singapore and beyond? So what I've seen is a lot of change at the front end. So suddenly last five years, so five years ago or even um, 10 years ago, everyone woke up and realized that there are all these fintechs who are delivering an excellent client experience, uh, not, in fact, not even fintechs. You have, you know, you know Apple and, uh, and Spotify and all amazing things that the customer can do now, and suddenly the banks needed to catch up. So everyone focused on the front end, on user experience, but it seems like everyone forgot about the back, the back office. So I, ha I would say I have seen a lot of change at the front end. I haven't seen as much happening at the back end. So, yes, I, I think that's a very, very valid point for me. Um, this might not be the most cutting edge fintech that we're experiencing at the moment, but for insurance companies, I think we have a lot of catch up to do. Um, I don't think we're there yet. There's a lot of exciting opportunities out there to really accelerate. Uh, one of the things I think to address the back office issues we have, because with a company like AXA, we deal with a lot of legacy. We have a lot of mainframe systems. We are not in the most up to date technology. So RPA, Robotics Process Automation, has helped us a lot over the past couple of years. Um, it's not overly expensive. I think there's far more advanced things out there to do. But for me, to address efficiency and customer experience, I think it's really helped uh, quite significantly. I, <coughs> me. I walked through my startup with a few banks, so I helped them to do some of the projects that related to analytics. I can see that they are quite willing to move forward. The problem is, as I said, is the data. 
quite often, even if we design something, we can't really see the effect. It's just like I pass you the black box, you try it out and let me know if it works okay. It's becoming more and more like the way I used to work with MINDEF. Everything, you just roughly tell me what you want, I just give it to you, it doesn't work, come back. I give it another version. Uh, that will slow down the process, but of course they have their own internal expertise. Uh, quite often we help them in training in some consultancies. And as I said, the, the banks know that they, they have to catch up, they have to improve. We look at China, China is improving quite a fair bit. Nothing, everything is about cashless. Uh, even you go to hawker centers, no one wants to accept cash. So we've heard a lot today about kind of like the back end of banks not actually catching up to the front end. And this is echoed not just by yourself, by gentlemen in the crowd. You know, and, and I've seen it, like the way a lot of these big software providers sell like to banks is the fact that once, you're, once they're in, they're in for life. Right, so so <laughs> a lot of the back ends of banks run, run on legacy systems. We all know that it could be SAP, it could be you know folks in that like Oracle. How do you? Uh, so this, so so I didn't prepare you guys for this question. So, <laughs> so how how do you see like like innovation happening like in 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 banks? Just from your own perspective, right? If if that's the that's the case. Well, you need to take risks, and uh, you just take it step by step, right? It's, uh, it can be an overnight transformation if you have to replace your entire mainframe, yeah. right? Yeah. Ping Chin, any, any, uh, <laughs> any wise words from uh, your experience? I'm, I'm not that pessimistic. I'm quite op optimistic. After working with some banks, I realized that they try to stay ahead. Of course, they, they still have COBOL systems, but that doesn't mean that they cannot take out the data run on the new uh, machines with new applications. They still can do analytics uh, as standalone and then feedback, whatever response, back to their uh, old, old system, whatever system they have. So that partly because you can't really change the system that fast. Uh, it's the day-to-day -day production systems. It's very hard to change, and usually, usually they use non-stop SQL. You need to run 24 by 7 non-stop, cannot fail, and so on. So you can't blame them. If I have to run the operations, uh, I will be the plumber in the banks. I, 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 I will have all the white hair by today. So uh, that, that's a fact of life, but it's improving. So, so if the banks are finding it so difficult, right, to change a lot of backend systems, so what kind of <laughs> opportunities, right, do you think um, uh, we could create, you know, for 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 fintech companies, right, in in this case? So, for what are they here to help to augment the existing financial system, or do you think they can come in and you know actually replace the financial system? So not from a banking perspective, from, but from an insurance perspective, we have the same problem. We have a lot of mainframe. Uh, cobalt technology exists in insurance, and it will exist for quite a long time in, in what I say, traditional insurance organizations. Um, but my limited knowledge in the IT space, I think, is, you know, it's a, it's a buzzword, move to cloud. But we have implemented platforms over the past two years using... Um, the move to cloud initiative and from a business perspective what i've seen is increased speed to market so whereas it would take us say three to four months to roll out a product on the life insurance side we've gone to market in less than mm, i think minimum four weeks now in the life insurance space that's that's a big achievement um you've got complex products complex pricing bigger risk um, so your time to market is key, and in the retail space, it needs to be even quicker. So we need to go into dynamic pricing models. Um, we're, we're doing a lot more of that in the retail space. It's, it's, it's interesting, and as, as you know, we say it's it's moving in the right direction, but I think we could be doing more. So the next question is: uh, So what has been the most significant tech disruption in your area of work? So for cash in the banking, and insurance, and the no portfolio probably in academics. Um, uh, could it potentially lead to structural disruption within the financial space? And, uh, and, and, and what does that mean? 
So I'll talk from uh, the bank's perspective. Um, it's a disruption in making. It's uh, application of artificial intelligence, especially at the, at the back office. It helps you cut costs. It helps you redefine your processes and just do things in a different way. The big problem is uh, uh, what Professor we mentioned is we just don't have the data or we need to spend a lot of time cleaning the first finding it, cleaning it, preparing, labeling, and it's a massive amount of work and the whole industry is scratching their heads at the moment on how do we do this? How do you suddenly, you know, overnight or over a couple of months transcribe millions of past recordings to be able to train um, a natural language processing system? Right? It just, uh, it's a Herculean task. So I think one thing I'm quite interested in and I'm looking to implement more operationally this year is the concept of customer sentiment analysis. Um, so I'm working with our chief data officer. Um, I don't believe anyone's nailed it yet. And like I say, it's not mature enough. Um, my dream, I think, how many of you have bought an insurance policy in Singapore? Okay. How many of you would say your experience has been excellent? No. <laughs> okay. And let's be honest, I don't, I don't think, and this is what we need to change um, from a customer experience point of view. And, and I say this to my, my boss, the CEO, and our CEO, we need to get customers to learn to love insurance and understand that it's a necessity because at the moment, there's no one that loves insurance, you know? There, a lot of people don't understand the, the need for it. Um, so for me, I, I wanna get to the customers really quickly. I wanna look at their interactions. I, I almost want to contact them before they contact me. Um, and I think it's possible through the data. I think I'm working with uh, Celine, our chief data officer at the moment, on sentiment analysis. So customers really do have a differentiating experience with us. Um, it, is it achievable straight away? No, but that's, that's my dream for this year. So just to dive a little deeper into that question, right? Um, in, in, like in, in, in America, uh, there are a lot of uh, interesting applications, you know, uh, companies have come up that are actually revolutionizing the insurance industry. Like making it lemonade, lemonade, and and, and a lot of other, <laughs> a lot, a lot. Everyone's of other jealous of lemonade. Come on, <laughs> great company. <laughs> <laughs> and and there's a lot of, of of very interesting companies have come up to, to to kind of just change the way people perceive insurance, right? I buy insurance way easy, way easier back there. Uh, the claims are never easy, so that's that's the one thing. <laughs> but but you know, buying it is super easy, right? Um, do you think there is? Do you think how how do you think like a big a big corporation like like AXA will come in and actually play together with some of these fintech you know companies or or, or play against them? Very simple. We have to play with them. I think we have to partner with some of these well these amazing brains that that have these great ideas. Um, we've we've played in the blockchain space. Um, so we we launched an initiative called Fizzy uh, around about eighteen months two years ago. Um, it was successful. But then I had a very interesting session three weeks ago with a guy called Peter Swar uh, Swartz, who's a futurist, well-known futurist, um, and opened my mind to blockchain a bit more and whether it really is doing what we think it would do. Um, but no, I think uh, we definitely have to partner with them. Um, I like to think of it more as big corporates taking a kind of entrepreneurial approach because they have to have that mindset. Um, and we have to challenge as well. We, ha we have to really step outside of our comfort zone and, and take these risks. I think for Bing Chin, this question is a bit different because uh, he is the tech, he's creating the tech disruption for the financial industry. So how, how has the technology, you know, or, or the expectation of technology uh, changed in, in your perspective from what you've, your, you've been offering? Uh, are these just different catchphrases, you know, we used to be big data and it became AI and it would, and it would be something else, right? Has it changed uh, substantially? Uh, definitely, it will, it will cause changes, just like today, you can do very fast KYC, which would take a long time to do, say a few years ago. Uh, suppose in another country like China, everyone has a credit. Once your face is uh, noted and then 
your background all come out. So that, that's the beauty or the ugliness of the technology. Uh, of course, the lending could be much faster, bigger risk could be taken just because of the analytics, because of so much information that we use not to be able to analyze and absorb today, we can use machine algorithm to absorb those news. Uh, it's not so much on whether technology is not quite there, it's more like how to map the technology onto your application, onto your, meet, onto your need, how to meet your need. So there's a gap between technical people like us and the domain experts. What you need, we have to translate technology to meet your need. Without knowing your need, I can create a technology, but you can say, look, it doesn't serve my purpose. Uh, you look at today's systems, just like accounting. Accounting systems, when you buy Oracle, Oracle have different cartridges. HR, fund management, accounting, and so on. How did they come about? Because of the subject matter experts that define all the rules, all the requirement, and the programmers are the ones that start to implement and that improve over the years and then start to put in the best practices of the world. So that is happening into banking sectors and how fast is the adoption is really up to the banks. Thank you. I, I think the the, the the interesting part about that is that you, you spoke about kind of like uh, social ranking, you know, and 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 you know issues of privacy around around individuals, right? And how, but that actually is a ripe source of of data for a lot of the banking institutions and uh, enterprises to actually make use of, right? So I wanted to touch a bit around regulation, right? And and also um, how that uh, intersects with uh, innovation. Right, a lot of like fintech is a highly regulated industry. The financial industry is highly regulated. You know, um, how do you see the role of of regulation uh, versus you know innovation? Whoever would like to start. Um, so I'll say that Singapore actually for banks is great when it comes to support for innovation. Like we've got a great ecosystem. There's a massive amount of fintechs. There's uh, a lot of support for the existing uh, the incumbents and for fintechs. We've got uh, fintech festivals, tons of events, uh, co collaboration spaces, accelerators, etc. So there's actually when you compare it to other markets, it's not that difficult. What I find is currently the biggest uh, showstopper for innovation is actually the banks themselves and, and their risk department. So banks have given quite recently a lot of the uh, control to in decision making to the risk departments and innovation always has to go through it. And uh, I think all of the banks are trying to figure out how do we make it work? How do we align our innovation and risk objectives to uh, <coughs> sorry, move things to the market? Kasha, do you see the same thing happening within the insurance space? I mean, uh, yes, I think uh, the regulation, I think, it goes hand in hand. But I think with the, the large, with AXA, we, we have to make sure that we are heavily invested. Um, so things like cybersecurity, I mean, we, we are, uh, you know, <laughs> we're victims all the time. So it's, um, it's really important. So I think from an investment perspective, we definitely make sure that it, it, it goes hand in hand and, and, and it's taken care of, yeah. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I just happens to work or own some small shares of a rec tech company. So even for a rec tech company, it's improving in technology. So it's about risk analytics, how to estimate the risk, how to control. Uh, apart from cybersecurity, there are other problems that the rec tech companies have to handle. And of course, KYC is one of them that they have to provide all, uh, all sort of database that link up together to do the KYC background check on the person before recommend for lending and so on. So all those have been sped up, has been improved because of technologies. And so long as they meet the regulations, uh, I doubt technologies is a problem. So technologies can always put whatever rules, whatever uh, 
and, and things that are required by the government into, into the systems and enforce it even much more effective than human. So, so I personally find this really interesting because my experience of using financial products, uh, uh, apps and all that in Singapore is very different from what, from what I've been using the past few years. Like uh, in the US, your password is still single case and you don't need alpha, alphanumerics, right? But that makes for a really excellent user experience, but uh, the fraud rates are extremely high. You know, so I, maybe every year, I, I guess someone puts a fraudulent charge on my card at least two or three times, you know, but, but the way, but how I see it is that the system itself takes over, so meaning that the reaction to a fraudulent case is faster, you know, than, 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 than the criminal itself. So on their end, they, they remediate kind of like um, the negative user experience, but the majority of my experience is perfect, right? But the moment something bad happens, uh, some, I, get, I get an alert and a warning. So this is a bit different from Singapore where, where we have like multiple levels of, uh, you know, uh, authentication, we have 2FA, hopefully not 3FA, you know, and, and that, that is the, what, what I see as the friction, right, in, in a lot of the, I guess that's regulated, right? But, but, but it's the friction that, that I see, you know, do you think there is, what do you think are alternate, alternative models, you know, of how we could make the user experience, you know, um, um, just more pleasant, right? Without even seeing someone, uh, like, talking to an operator, just, just the app experience alone, or just the service experience alone. I didn't prepare you guys for this either, so. <laughs> well, I, I, so I've probably got a, um quite a good example of this. We have a, an app that we, uh, we use for customers called MyAXA. So it allows customers to go in and request changes of address, simple fund switches. Uh, very, very, at the moment, you know, what I would say quite basic, but, but good value add requests so they're not coming through to my call center. However, um, because of the 2FA issues and login and the complexity, does have a negative customer experience. So when I look at the feedback, it, it, yes, it impends it quite a lot. <laughs> Can we find a way of removing that? I would absolutely love that. Will the regulator allow it? I don't know. <laughs> but for me to get that ex exceptional customer experience, um, there has to be more, yes, this, the, the, it needs to be more seamless. Yeah. Okay. I, I wouldn't comment on user experience, let me comment on fraud cases. Fraudulent detection is one of the hardest problems to solve. I have to build huge graph about the relationships. Say, for example, if I want to check, check a bank and so on, I have to find a way to hide my path. And that tends to involve huge amount of data. The problem is that we can't get hold of the data. Even if I get hold of the data, the data is biased. Biased in the sense that only those cases that have been detected are made known to me. How about those cases are not known? This is a bit like using algorithm to detect uh, malware or virus. Uh, malware detections is a lot easier because we use past cases to say this is malware and the hackers tend to be a bit lazier, then they tend to do a bit of mutations and then they release the next version. So that is easy. But what if they come out with a new malware, new virus, there's no way that algorithm can detect. AI is a bit like little kid. So what it learns, it knows. What it doesn't learn, doesn't experience, it won't be able to detect. You won't be able to say, oh, this is a new malware, this is a new fraud case. It won't be able to tell that this is a new fraud case until human put in, label it, say this is a fraud case. Then you start to find the patterns on how the fraud case happens. So that is one of the most difficult, uh, I would say, research problems, partly because lack of data, lack of cases, and you just can't get hold of the data. Uh, for example, uh, I heard uh, there are plenty in some islands, Estonia or somewhere, there are banks that have plenty, faced lots of uh, fraud cases. So there are countries that face more than other countries, just like in US, you tend to have your uh, visa cards number stolen and then used, and then you, you start to have to, to try to protect your visa card. Thanks, Wing Chin. Um, 
Okay, so moving on to the topic of hype versus reality. So we've, we've heard a lot about all the different buzzwords you know, used within uh, uh, the finance industry and fintech, right? So how much of what we see as potential disrupting tech, for example, you know, blockchain, decentralized ledger technology, AI for whatever, you know, and, and et cetera, it's, it's just hype instead of actually really doing things in a better way. So is this just a way for them to get more investment dollars, you know, and just to sell? Um, what do you think? Well, I would talk about the technology that's in a hype stage more from the perspective of it's just gaining some traction rather than just uh, you know attracting investments and using it somewhere else. But I would talk about blockchain actually or distributed ledger technology um, just earlier this month. So right now, most of the banks have blockchain projects. Like everyone jumped on it and everyone thinks that's the ultimate solution to you know, data, to secure, data security, unmutability of your data, etc. But earlier this month, uh, there was a case, and I don't think that was the first one, where Coinbase uh, was taken over, 50, more than 50%, 51% of their network has been taken over by a hacker, and that person was able to um, alter the transactions being made on uh, Ethereum and uh, spent um, 1.1 million dollars in uh, double spent in uh, tokens, and then those transactions could never be reversed because that's how blockchain works. So, blockchain doesn't seem to be as secure and unchangeable as we thought, and that might make some uh, financial institutions stop and rethink what uh, they want to do with it. So yeah, I touched earlier on blockchain, and only because I was very well educated by this, by Peter Schwartz, who just blew my mind, um, talking about you know the future, and it's like he's travelled in time already. Um, what I have been impacted by, and what I think is not hype, is is big data. Um, data in the, in the past year that I've been working on customer experience has, I, I, I've seen the real value of what we can do with amazing data, clean data proper processes, um, something that I'm just familiarizing myself with, and I don't know whether we would say it's fintech or whether it's cutting edge, but I've been working very closely with a company on social listening, um, and that's really interesting to me because it allows me to look at customers' feedback through social platforms um, like Facebook. Customers will complain on social channels. Um, it's one of the most popular ways for them to get to the get to the company straight away and for us to react. We have to react immediately. So for me, it's great because I get instantaneous notifications when a post has gone up because I can't be on these platforms all the time. So for me, social listening is very interesting. That's why I've got this sort of very big interest in customer sentiment reporting as well. So yeah, big big data for me is, is not hype. It's, it, it's imperative. <laughs> big Jin, any thoughts? Okay. term code is law. There's no such thing as code is law, although the blockchain people uh, Although the, the, the coders try to claim code is law, the problem with blockchain is that everything is controlled by smart contracts. And who write those smart contracts? Who decide when to fork, when to split the, the the chain into two chains. So that is a problem of blockchain. It's still not decentralized. It's not decentralized in the sense that it's still controlled by a small set of people, and sometimes controlled by a small set of very rich people, uh, those people who make money from the blockchain. So I have a blockchain company too, funded by, invested by <laughs> SGI, but that is on uh, healthcare data. So at one time we thought we could use blockchain to pull data from different hospitals, make it more personalized. You own your data, you control on who can see your data, you go everywhere, see the doctors you want to see, give them your public key, 
and they can view your data. You don't have to be constrained to one hospital. But with the leakage of the data, now no hospitals are willing to let you pull the data out and put onto the blockchain systems. That is a sad story. But of course you can say, I can get the patients to scan the discharge summary, the report, and then upload to the system. I can easily uh, try to extract all the contents from the report, but that won't scale. So again, technology might be there because it, it helps to integrate, helps to put all the data together. Even though, as I said earlier, blockchain does not scale. It's very slow. The TPS is very low. It's slow. Ethereum is about eight per second. Bitcoin is about three to eight per second. Even you look at all those hyperledger, it's about 600 to 1,000. These are the real transactions, not just say send out consensus and then everyone send it back and that's all. It's much more than that. Real world application is much more than just simply send out something and you acknowledge. It's much more than that. It's a bit like your OLTP database operations. I move money from one place to another, we share documents, or when there's a, for logistic, the goods move from one spot to another spot, pass from one agent to an agent, from one organization to another organizations that involve quite a fair bit of uh, database operation, what we call OLTP, online transactions processing operation. That is not that cheap as compared to send out a message, you acknowledge and send it back. That is not real life. Real life is about you acknowledge, check, and keep into your database. And for blockchain, the problem is that replication. It replicates in all nodes. Every node is the same. Store everything the same. So that's why today, uh, just now, someone said people go for dispute ledger. That is a correct approach. If you want to go for dispute ledger, it means that you already relax the consensus model. You do away with the consensus model, therefore, you can speed up faster. But that, again, is a different, uh, that was give you a different requirements on security. So you're being mindful of time, because I want to make sure I leave enough time for your questions. Uh, I'll go to, the, to the, our final section, which is about the future, right? So, which is where, what we're here to talk about. So where do you see the financial industry moving you know, in the next 5, 10, 15 years? Well, I think there's a lot to be done around um, building trust. So I think still, on many angles, the customer side, the regulator side, there still needs to be more trust building. And on the customer side, I mean for banks and for insurers, what can you do to make your product easier to understand, your terms and conditions and your fees easier to understand, and the whole experience of uh, you know, buying a unit trust or a life insurance, just a pleasant one. And on the regulator side, I think there's a lot that's going to be happening in the reg tech space, because uh, there's just more and more regulations coming up, and the banks are just really looking outside on who can help us uh, comply. Uh, I agree with Kasia. I think that for insurers, um, and it may not be a model that, I mean, it's been a model that's been around for, for years in other parts of the world, but I think we have to um, educate customers on insurance. I think customers want to self-serve. Uh, they don't want to call and request something and then two weeks later get the outcome. They want to do it instantaneously. I think we will see more of a self-service model. We would almost see customers, you know, in the future underwriting their own insurance, which is crazy, I think. Um, but for me, if you really took it to, a, a, you know, a, 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 say a space age level, you could almost have R really great underwriting models that, um, that w would revolutionise the way we sell sell and service business. Yeah. Ping Ching. Okay. Uh, in the future, I expect some of the e-commerce companies going to disrupt the banks. E-commerce like Alibaba, everything Alipay is like what? It's like bank. And Alipay today, you don't have to pay transaction fees on both sides. And they start to say, I'm going to convert or slowly extend it to become like Visa card. You don't have to pay me immediately. You, I, you can owe me based on your credit, but eventually that will be more and more like banks. So 
if the banks do not improve, then the e-commerce companies will become banks and then eventually people will go to e-commerce company because you have everything into one app. Whereas banks is still, you go to ATM, press, go to one account, press, also a pin to transfer the money out. But today, when you look at some of those e-payment, just take out your phone, everything is paid, everything is transferred, you don't have to go through the hassle. And I foresee some of the banks will go away and some of these e-commerce will become really huge banks. Just look at some of the uh, shopping festival, Double Eleven, that's well made known by the China. For them to sell billions of dollars of goods, they can keep the money for one week such that people can return the goods and one people pay, they keep the money for one week, you can see that how they can spend the money. They can spend the cash, they can loan you the cash, they can loan you, do the peer-to-peer -peer lending to you because they have all your information in their database. And that is disruption. That is going to cause lots of disruptions to the banking industry. So with, with, all the, with all that in mind, like, what do you think are some of the ways in which entrepreneurs can create products you know, to actually help to solve some of these problems? Right? And how, how would you encourage um, entrepreneurs to actually work, for example, with a bank, with an insurance company, you know, and, and for Prof. Ui, you know, how, how can you know, like startups engage you and, and, your, and your other startups and your research students to actually create products for, for, for the industry? So whoever wants to begin. So I think ACTS are uh, active promoters of, of entrepreneurs and we, we have specific investment channels where we look at entrepreneurs. So for me, if anyone out there is very interested in talking about customer sentiment analysis or anything that can improve customer experience proactively and has solutions or some ideas, I would be more than happy to talk to them. Kasia? Uh, so two things. One is... Um, on the angle of how can you work better with banks. Uh, we're meeting quite a lot of fintechs, and uh, the biggest problem I see is that the companies usually have a great product, but they can't really explain what's the value proposition, what will it help me improve, like how much revenue uplift can I expect, or how much can you help me decrease my cost base. So we always work with the fintechs that come to us to really work through, okay, great product, but tell me understand the value. Can you quantify it? And the second thing on the opportunity that's still there in the market, I definitely see a big opportunity in um, someone helping banks figuring, figuring out the data that goes into AI training and helping train. Because when you have to um, to outsourcing or, or, or bringing in a fintech who has a great model is great, but you have to feed that model with tons and tons of data for the model to be relevant to your organization. And uh, banks that just don't have the capacity to sit and go through uh, millions of hours of recordings or paper forms and convert it into something that can be used uh, for training. Interesting. So, would would, uh, would would startups just directly approach uh, yourselves? You know, how, how, how like how does the process uh, work, and typically, how long is that? Is that like is that POC stage they need to go through? You know, and, and how does that translate into an actual deal? Uh, and maybe if you could share like some of the the, the metrics or, or, or key indicators you're looking for in companies when you work with them. Uh, so there are different angles. One is, of course. In our yearly cycle, we decide on a number of problems we will be solving for the bank. And then we try to look at, okay, who has solved it already in the industry or outside of the financial industry? If uh, there are companies that are already solving the problem, then we bring them in and see how uh, we can work together. If no one has solved it, then we look at how the solution, the ideal solution should look like. Usually it's a patchwork of uh, different components that are available in the market, some things we have to build together. Uh, so again, we br bring fintechs and try to arrive at uh, a, a one solution. And we usually do, uh, after we 
decided what the solution could be and what the measurement criteria are. We usually look at you know, what's the quantitative benefit, qualitative, so when we test it with the end users, what, what do we want to hear from them? How do we build a business case? Once we have that ready, we build a proof of concept with um, uh, partners. Sometimes when there isn't a solution available, uh, we work on something else else. We run a prototype and then we uh, take it into the organization to get the funding for the next stage. So we run the pilot. Once the pilot is successful, then there's a high chance it goes into production. And Bing Chen, for yourself, you know, are there like inter engagement models where, in which you know, uh, like a corporation could work with with uh, the researchers in your organization, and how would you encourage that? Uh, sure, we have different models. Uh, we have translation team that help to translate university research to something that closer to what you need. We are under pressure to translate. And of course, you can engage, uh, work with our professors as well, either as consultant, as partner, whatever. That is more of a, a personal uh, a, a arrangement between the companies as well as the professors. And if you are game enough, do a industry PhD. Four years, you get your head damaged, you get a PhD called doctors. <laughs> And uh, it's a much easier path to get a PhD, but you have to be PR or Singaporeans to uh, do industry PhD. That is the uh, easiest way. Suppose you are doing startup, might as well enroll one in the uh, industry PhD and uh, get your PhD at the same time, tap onto the resources. Once you come to NUS, we have no choice. We have to tell you what we know to we can't even say I'm going to charge you a few thousand per day. I just it's my job to to make sure that you are well trained. Uh, we do have student internship, or either we send out students to the industry, or industry people come to our labs to sit there for a while. That again can be arranged. Uh, I usually take uh, interns from other countries and. We have other arrangements, of course, can go through our enterprise. Uh, for example, Kelvin is in, in charge of that. NUS is under pressure, or all the universities are under pressure to do translation to show that what we have done can be useful to the industry, can help the local industry, and that is much more important than to make money out of, from the industry. So you should exploit that because we are really under pressure. It's, it's not easy to be, to be uh, working for a university, frankly. <laughs> Thank you, Richard. Um, so I, I'll, I'll end all, all my questions there. Um, I'm going to open up the, the, the floor to the questions to the floor. Uh, maybe could I have the Slido page, please? So uh, for those of you who have questions, oh, for those of you who have questions to ask, um, uh, we actually have, we, we're using Slido. Uh, so for those of you who have submitted the questions, and there's a lot of you, uh, thank you. Um, for those who have not, uh, have a read at some of the questions and, and vote for some of your favorite ones. Um, so I'll, I'll quickly start off with the first one. Um, so Kasia and Kath, have you worked with startups in the FinTech space? And uh, what have been your objectives and experiences so far? Yes, so a lot of what we do at Evolve is uh, involves working with uh, fintechs. Uh, what the experience has been uh, frankly mixed because as I said, a lot of the companies have great solutions, but we spent a lot of time trying to help them articulate how will you help the bank? Because in the end, I have to take the solution and I have to sell it to my stakeholders in the bank and convince them, guys, this is great. This is going to decrease your processing time by 50% and decrease your cost base of this process by X percent. So it's, I would say that's the biggest thing to improve. So I mentioned the social listening earlier. Um, the company I, I work with, Digimind, I, I'm really impressed. A um, little bit probably bigger than a startup, but um, in terms of you know 
large companies partnering with smaller, much smaller companies, it's been very successful. I'm a big fan because uh, we can make decisions much more quickly. We can be agile. And I don't use the word agile lightly because uh, we use that word a lot. Um, but it, it's definitely worked. So my experience has been very positive and we actively look at startups within Access Singapore. We have an innovation department, so we need to scout for good, great startups to look at what they're offering and how they can add value to our business model. Yeah. Thank you. Um, okay, next question. Oh, here we go. Um, oh my goodness. Uh, oh. Oh dear, I did. <laughs> uh, no, I deleted that one. On okay, you go. <laughs> okay, you can't see the question there because I pressed the archive button too quickly. Uh, oh my goodness, my my fat fingers. Uh, with the trend towards open API, why aren't banks really going into it? <laughs> Where's the trend? Um, like uh, increasingly, as 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 more people start talking about and having open APIs and 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 providing more access. You know, to, to various APIs within within like banks' processes. Uh, um, why aren't many banks going into it? So, I think banks are to some extent <laughs> allergic to sharing, to just hearing that their data is going to go out of the bank. Uh, I think that's a big um, showstopper. Like, while wow, suddenly my. Uh, client identifying data might leak out. Oh my gosh, I won't do it, right? So that's the position of the bank, banks, so they're extremely cautious. But uh, the, the MAS is uh, very, very supportive of it and uh, pushing all of us to do it. So I think eventually everyone will have to move. Mm. Any other comments? No, okay. Uh, let's see. Uh, uh, maybe go on to Kai's question. Okay. Um, I think we answered this just now, which is what are some of the key niches in, in fintech where you see opportunities in the coming years ahead? I think you mentioned regtech as one of the areas, you know, um, and, and Kath, I think, I think it's around user experience. Uh, are there any other things you would like to share? Yeah, I mean, user experience definitely, and I think making insurance more accessible. So someone mentioned open APIs. We actually have a platform which um, our digital director is, um, it's been spoken about at other innovation events. Thomas Kachik um, has developed insurance as a service. Uh, so we integrate with companies like Carousel. Uh, it's trying to make the customer experience more seamless when buying insurance and, and reaching more points for us as well to to increase customer base, I guess, as well. So uh, we're definitely in that in that space and see a lot more of it coming. Cool. Um, any other comments on the key niches in Gentech? Okay. Next question. Okay, this one is a touchy one. Can you discuss the failure of the use of IBM Watson in DBS? So I'm not sure who, uh, uh, who this is from? Yeah. yeah. Hmm. Uh, does someone have some in, uh, inside information that we don't? From <laughs> okay, we'll we'll give this one a miss, just uh, because I, I'm, I mean, like, I'm not sure any of us can comment <laughs> about DVS unless. Ah, here you go. I got some posts there in the news, uh, but not this one because I can't get found. Okay. Uh, IBM Watson is not that bad a system. Uh, IBM Watson has been sold for healthcare, finance, and other areas. So it's just like the way we build system, we build the base systems on top, we put knowledge base. Banks will have a different knowledge base. Healthcare will have a different knowledge base that we build from either existing knowledge bases, SNOMAC, UMLS, whatever that you have out there, plus input from the doctors. So it's the same for banks. Banks require all these knowledge bases on local practices. Therefore, IBM Watson being a generic huge system is much harder to adapt to meet the requirements. I only know about healthcare that you can refer to the news is that IBM Watson's project with Anderson, MD Anderson's worth about 70 plus million USD. 
was cancelled in 2017. Bartley could not meet the requirement that it promised, cancer treatment. Cancer treatment is very tough. It's about response to certain medicines, so involved lots of pharmacogenomics and all of those, our genes be, react differently to uh, the, the medicines. Uh, different people have different reactions and so on. And last year, MSK again complained. So some of the projects on healthcare again. And that are the two cases. So the problem could be, might not be the system, but be because they try to do in a hurry, being a commercial project, you can't say I'm going to take a long time to clean up the data to understand your need, therefore I'm going to fine tune the systems. And another problem is that when all the research, all the good things are done in the headquarters, in the labs, the locals or those people who do not know the system that well try to roll out, implement the local system, that could create the gap that caused the system not to be able to meet the requirements. So for all fairness, I, I don't get any money from uh, IBM. I'll say it's not a bad system, it's just maybe just uh, uh, not being implemented properly in some cases. Thank you, Wing Chun. Okay, maybe last three questions. Um, only a handful of POCs and banks have made it through to implementation due to integration with core banking systems. But banks also need AI to drive efficiency, right? So maybe to the panel, you know, um, what do you think is the, is the right balance of that? And what's, is, there, is there a potential solution? Up? Let, let, let me start with the complaint first, because I, I work at the banks and then just now, Cassia, is it? Yes. Just mentions that for her to sell a solution, she has to sell it to stakeholders. That takes months. Suppose you have business to run, you want to sell to a bank. You, you don't hope to close a deal until months. Maybe you'll say, oh, okay, and then come back, and one year maybe close that deal and then start to implement projects. So the, the problem is, is just that the period of adoptions, buying, is very long. Therefore, it's very hard for banks to to adopt quickly, partly because it's a cost to them. And most of the banks are run by business people, either from finance side, from accounting side. Every dollar is a dollar. So you spend on IT, it's a dollar gone. And therefore, they need lots of justifications just to roll out any IT solutions. Because the benefit of IT solutions won't be immediate. And that also create opportunities for new companies to create this option. Just look at blockchain. Blockchain has a big consortium called R trees. From JP Morgan, some of the big banks are all in this. But after the R trees, the Corda system has been released and all those. How many have really implemented Corda systems? So again, is the period of adoptions the buy-in time is too long. Um, I'm switching it off. Yeah. So it's it's uh, also about the risk. So to give you an example, we recently uh, worked on a project that uh, used uh, a machine learning model model to uh, detect anomalies in transactions to be able to decrease the the false positives that currently have to be. Uh, reviewed by uh, humans. And the system was able to just, it had amazing results. It could help us really uh, transform the whole process of monitoring transactions. But the problem was that that system was a black box. And because it was, um, uh, it was um, from a company, an external company. And uh, we just couldn't figure out, uh, you know, what do we take to the regulator? Uh, we can't take the black box. We can't say, well, we think we're 100% compliant because this thing told us it is. And uh, we can't open it because it's uh, IP. And so the company rightfully so said, well, we can't really give you a source code. And 
uh, you know, the details of how the algorithm works because it's, it's our IP. So there's a big risk involved, and I think there's also a, a role that the regulator can play to, um, to help clarify some of the, uh, the issues that uh, both the banks and the fintechs are facing. Thanks, Kasia. Last question. This one has, uh, has nine votes. Um, the UK has open banking, where customers can see all bank accounts uh, running on different providers in one app. So do you see a similar solution being offered in Singapore? So, so, so a bit like Mint.com, and what it does, it aggregates you know, multiple uh, financial accounts. So do you think this is something that will happen in Singapore eventually? So I think uh, Credit Suisse is already doing, to some extent, asset aggregation. So you can, uh, I forgot the name of the, the fintech, but they're it's Canopy, right? They're working with Canopy to do asset aggregation from uh, not only um, the client's assets with the bank, but external assets. So it's happening to some extent already. So for those who, who want to do this on a personal basis, I actually use a paid service called Tiller HQ. So that actually gives you access to all the bank accounts in most places. Uh, they, run, they run through an API, uh, which is powered by an API, one of the companies, I can't remember the name. But, uh, but yeah, but it accesses you know, a lot of accounts all over the world, you know, and you can build you know, your own macros on top of it. So anyway, just some uh, extra information. Um, so I think we will stop here uh, for today's panel. Can you please uh, join me to thank our panelists for, for their time and also for all the insights? So we, we do have some time now for some networking. I'll let you guys then have a chat with our panelists you know, and uh, amongst yourselves. Uh, thanks so much for being here today. Uh, I look forward to seeing everyone again. Thank you.